And I'm going to be talking about the coming war with Amalek. I believe the spring of this next year through the spring of 2025, we're prophetically going to see the Isaiah 17 war take place and the Psalm 83 war take place. Look at Exodus 15, verse 2. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my what? Yeshua. He's become my Yeshua, and the voice of rejoicing and Yeshua is where? In the tabernacles of the righteous. Wow. So here we go. Here's the tabernacles. And Yeshua is now in the tabernacles of the righteous. This is Psalm 118, which is sung every Sukkot for the last 3,000 years. They sing this Psalm 118. And so what happens? Yeshua is being born and Joseph and Miriam are hearing and they're singing. Wow. The Lord is my strength and my song, and the Lord has become my Yeshua. He's my God, and I'm going to prepare a habitation. My Father is God, and I will exalt him. And here this habitation is prepared. It's the sukkah. Now look at Psalm 118, verse 24 and 25. It says, this is the day which the Lord has made. We will what? Why? Because God commanded them to rejoice. Can you imagine? God says for eight days, I don't want to hear no whiny whinies. You are going to rejoice for eight days. Why? Because he knew during the Feast of Tabernacles when my Messiah would be born. Can you imagine? The surprise birthday party wasn't for Yeshua. It was for all of Israel. What a big surprise. Yeshua is born. They don't even realize it. And they're seeing Yeshua is in the Tabernacles of the Righteous. And they don't even know that Yeshua is in the tabernacles of the righteous on the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, look at Luke 2, 8 through 11. There were shepherds. Oh, let me show you this picture first here too. Everyone's commanded to rejoice. So they have these big rejoicing parties celebrating Messiah's birth and they don't even realize it's his birthday. Look at Luke 2, 8 through 11. There were shepherds in the same country, staying in the field. Where were they? Stay. They weren't just in the field. They were staying in the field. And they were keeping watch by night over their flock. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood by them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. And the angel said, don't be terrified. Behold, I bring you good news of what? Which is why he commanded them to rejoice because someday in the future there's going to be great joy because the Messiah is born. And they say, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah the Lord. You are not commanded to rejoice during Passover. You are commanded to rejoice during Sukkot because that's when the Messiah is going to be born. Now here we have the sheep. And the shepherds are where? Staying in the field. If this happened around Christmas in Israel, you have freezing rain. I mean, it is cold. That's why we don't do tours in December and January and February. Because it's going to be cold rain. The shepherds don't stay in the fields in the middle of December. All the sheep are put in their pens. Now, as a matter of fact, 
If you remember, they were in Nazareth, and they went down to Bethlehem. Well, the, and Bethlehem is just a couple miles from Jerusalem. But can you imagine, it is 40 miles from Nazareth to Jerusalem. They didn't have cars back then. Okay, that's important uh, to realize. Would it be kind of the Father in heaven to have Miriam, who was over nine months pregnant, riding a camel 40 miles in the freezing rain and snow? Not going to happen. But what happens, the Feast of Tabernacles, they have huge caravans and multitudes and thousands are going to the temple. And so she just joins them in a, a nice wagon and they're all going together as a group. It's not like her and Joseph are alone riding a donkey or a camel or a horse. That would not be kind. As a matter of fact, here is a picture of Jerusalem in the winter. Here you go. Take a look at that. Okay, so God is not going to have Miriam in the middle of winter ride a camel or whatever when she's over nine months pregnant, bouncing up and down on a stupid camel or horse. That's just not the way God works. Okay, so that's, again, another proof that didn't happen at Christmas. Look at John 1, 14. The word was made flesh, and what did he do? Oh, amazing, he tabernacled during the Feast of Tabernacles. What a concept. And we beheld his glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So here we see what happened. The word became flesh in John 1, and he dwelt among us, which also is he tabernacled among us. And then look at Luke 2, 13. Suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Can you imagine? Here they're up in heaven. I have night lights over in the Middle East. There's not too many lights. But back then, there was like no lights except over Jerusalem with the lights of the temple menorahs that were there. And the angels, you know, they're saying... Glory to God in the highest and on earth, good will toward men. This never would have happened at Passover. This never would have happened at Christmas. This would only have happened during the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, here's what is incredible. I want you to think about this. Look at Luke 2, 21. When the eight days were fulfilled for the circumcision of the child, his name was called what? And when do they give children their names? On the eighth day. And most people don't make this connection. He's circumcised on the eighth day, which is the day he gets his name, and he is named Yeshua, which means what? Bashan. This was given by the angel before he was even conceived in the womb. So what is happening? Think about this. He's being circumcised on the eighth day. If he was born on Sukkot, that takes you to Shemini Atzeret. The eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And where is he when he's being circumcised? He is in the temple shedding his blood, confirming the covenant to Abraham. On the eighth day. God is the perfect uh, uh, orchestra, director. How can this, I mean, this just shows you there has to be a God. Look at Luke 2, 22 through 24. It says, when the days of their purification, according to the Torah of Moses, were fulfilled. So what were they doing during his time? They were following the Torah. They brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the Torah of the Lord, that every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the Torah, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, do you know that is not, that's the truth, but it's not the whole truth. Where do you think you're going to find the whole truth? By going to the Torah, because it says they follow the Torah. So let's go to Leviticus 12, 6 and 8. It says, when the days of our purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she has to bring what? 
A lamb of the first year is actually what was required for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to the priest. But if they're poor, if they are so poor, she's not able to afford to bring a lamb. Well, then she can bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. And the priest will make atonement for her and she shall be clean. Okay, so what were they supposed to bring? But they couldn't afford a lamb, which also tells you the three magi hadn't come with the money yet. Okay. And what else do we see? They were poor. They wish they had had a lamb. They did. They had the lamb of God. They had the lamb of God. They didn't need the lamb. Isn't that just mind-blowing? What time is it? Okay, I'll go just a little bit longer. Now, again, Leviticus 23, 33. I'm just going to real quickly highlight some things. The Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the children of Israel. On the 15th day of this seventh month is the Feast of Booze for how many days? Okay, the 15th day of the seventh month. That is Tishri. But what else happens on the 15th day of any month? Full moon. So he was born on a full moon in the light of day. Now, look at this. Deuteronomy 16, 13 through 15. You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days. And the day with the Lord is a thousand years. And for 7,000 years... We're dwelling in temporary tabernacles, okay? But look at this. It says, you shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days after you have gathered in your corn and your wine, and you what? Shall rejoice. That's a command. It, it, your, God is commanding you to rejoice. Can you imagine that? If you were depressed, that's tough. You have to rejoice because my son's going to be born, and we're going to have a party, and I want everyone to rejoice. In your feast, you, your son, daughter, manservant, maidservant, Levite, stranger, fatherless, widow, seven days you shall keep a solemn feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God shall choose because the Lord your God is going to bless you in all your increase and in all the works of your hands. Therefore, you shall what? Can you imagine a commandment to be happy for seven days? That's got to be hard for some people. Now, look at Luke 23 through 40. It says, on the first day, you're to take the fruit of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, boughs of thick trees, willows of the brook. And again, you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And then look at Leviticus 23, 41 through 44. You have to keep a feast to the Lord for seven days. It's a statute forever throughout your generations. You're to keep it in the seventh month. You have to dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native born in Israel shall dwell in booths that your generation may know. I made the children of Israel to Dwell in booths when I brought him out of the land of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. And so Moses declared this to the children of Israel, the appointed feast of the Lord. Look at Zechariah 14. Notice three times he said they have to dwell in booths. In Zechariah 14, 14 through 19, Judah will fight at Jerusalem. The wealth of all the nations are going to be gathered together. The gold, the silver, apparel in great abundance. Why? If you remember, they plundered the pagans at Passover. They got all the Egyptian stuff. Well, that's going to be a pattern. It's going to repeat again. And all the nations are going to end up bringing their gold and silver and great abundance to Israel. And it says, so will be the plague of the horse, mule, camel, donkey, and all the beasts shall be in these tents is this plague. And it'll come to pass. Everyone that is left of all the nations. So in other words, here are your humans that are going to survive the tribulation, which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to do what? Keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And whoever doesn't come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem and worship the king, the Lord of hosts, they get no rain. And if the family of Egypt doesn't come, they not only get no rain, but they also get the plague wherewith the Lord is going to smite all the heathen that do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt, punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, do we get the idea we're supposed to keep the Feast of Tabernacles? Three times. 
But of course, we can only do what we can do. So we do what we can do as a memorial and as a reminder of what the feast is all about. It's reading how to ride a bicycle won't help you ride a bicycle. Studying the feast will not help you. You need to do the feast. Then you really begin to understand what they mean. Let me show you this. In 2 Peter 1.16, Peter says, We've not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. We were eyewitnesses. Peter saw the second coming in a vision. Look at Matthew 17.4. When it happened, Peter said to Yeshua at the transfiguration, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you will, let us make here three, what? Tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. In other words, that's three Sukkot, three tabernacles. Peter saw his coming will be at the Feast of Tabernacles. That's why he's building three uh, Sukkahs. It's not going to happen in the spring. All these fall feasts will be fulfilled in the fall. Okay, Exodus 25, 8 and 9. He says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to the pattern of the tabernacle. God always uses patterns. We have to learn his pattern. Revelation 21, 1 through 4, what do we see? John says, I saw the city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. This is why Zechariah 14, that's to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, because Yeshua is going to be here at the Feast of Tabernacles and he'll reign for a thousand years. And the tabernacle of God is with men. Numbers 29, 12, and 13. On the 15th day of the 17th month, it goes on to say that they're to offer 13 bulls from the herd. Why do they offer the 13 bulls? Anyone know why on the first day they're to offer 13 bulls? It goes on by the eighth or seventh day, they've offered 70 bulls. Okay, they're to offer 13, then 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7. And it comes to 70 bulls. Yom Kippur is only for the nation of Israel. They would make atonement for themselves. So five days later on Sukkot, they would make atonement for the 70 nations. So Yom Kippur is only about Israel. It's not about anyone else. And Sukkot is all about the nations. God having Israel as the priests of the world, making atonement for the nations. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the sages often say that if the nations had only known what God was doing for them during Sukkot, making atonement, they never would have destroyed the temple. They'd have put their armies around it to protect it. But isn't that smart? The devil uses the very thing we hate and want to destroy is the very thing that could have helped us. So we'll close with this. Let me just say that uh, the celebrations in the temple, like I said, there are over 2 million people in Jerusalem. And those who arrived there came to what? Rejoice. All right. Uh, The focus was the water libation. In the temple, there was this women's court. You can see the big candlesticks. There were four of those. And that's where the priests would get ladders and they would climb up and they'd have uh, like seven gallon barrels of oil and they would use it to dump into those. They'd have the priestly garments cut in strips for wicks. But it was a huge party. This is the women's court. The women were in the elevated balconies there. And then the men were down dance, dancing down below. There'd be these two priests that are coming and they'd be blowing shofars literally all night long. The events would go and there'd be millions of people there. So here they would all be building sukkahs. There were sukkahs built all over Jerusalem, all the way to Bethlehem. They had sukkahs. Everyone's supposed to be in a sukkah. And then look at Exodus 15 too. It says, the Lord is my strength and my song and he's become what? Remember, this is the song at the sea when they crossed the Red Sea during Passover week. And what do we find? Psalms 118, which is the Hallel, which they sing. That has the same verse. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has what? Become my salvation. And so what do we see during that week? They not only sing Psalm 118, they also sing Isaiah 12, 2. Why? Because Isaiah 12, 2 is the only other place where it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For God, the Lord, is my strength and my song, and he has become my Yeshua. And what happens? That happens on the Feast of Tabernacles. God has become their Yeshua. And what else do we see? The next verses. 
Therefore, with joy, will you draw water out of the wells of salvation or Yeshua. That's why in John chapter 7, when they were all singing, they were singing, this is what they were singing. And the minute they sang, with joy, will you draw waters out of the wells of salvation? That's when Yeshua interrupted the whole song service and said, yes, as this scripture says, whoever comes to me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. It was on the feast of Sukkot when they're singing this that he interrupts them in John chapter 7. This is what they're singing. Why is that so amazing? Because look at the last verse. There's only six verses. The very next thing. On the Feast of Tabernacles. <gasps> Cry and shout out, you inhabitant of Zion, for great in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Here he was born at Sukkot. Now he's ministering as an adult. And he interrupts their song service. And he says, yes, come to me. Well, guess what? Now they have to finish the song, and it is, cry and shout out, great in the midst of you is the Holy One of Israel. Unless you know the Hebraic roots and haven't followed replacement theology, you're never going to see all this. But wait, there's more. I'll teach on Sukkot. So then you rejoice in the Torah. And that's what they're doing. They're rejoicing in the living Torah, Messiah, during the Feast of Sukkot. This is why he couldn't have been born on Passover. All right? But look at this. I'm closing with this. How many years in a Shemitah cycle? Okay, I want all of you online to record this. Watch it. Put it in your notes. Don't forget it. Because this isn't in your notes. Okay, there's seven years in a Shemitah cycle, right? Okay, so I have down here 1911, 1912, 13, 14, 15, 16, 1917 was a Shemitah year. Now, the first thing, people use this, but there's a big problem with this. Some people will say uh, 1917 was a jubilee year, and so was 1967, which is 50 years later, because they see in 1917 was World War I, and Jerusalem was recaptured, and 67, Jerusalem's recaptured, and that's 50 years apart. So they say that must be a jubilee year. Wrong. Completely wrong. As you look at the Shemitah years, everyone knows 2001 was a Shemitah year, but here's the problem with this calendar. How many of you knew, know God does not use our pagan Gregorian calendar? Right. If you say that 2001 was a Shemitah year, you have to ask yourself, well, was it the first nine months of 2001 or the last three months of 2001? Because a biblical year begins at Rosh Hashanah, which is in September, October. So 2001 in one sense, can't be a Shemitah year because you haven't defined it enough. Is it the first half of 2001 or the last half of 2001? So anyone that gives you a calendar date based on our years, they don't know what they're talking about. You following me? Okay, but we're going to pretend we're going to use this for the moment because that's what people use that don't know what they're talking about. Okay, but 2001 people recognize as a Shemitah year and 2008 and 2015 and last... Uh, the year before, 2022, was a Shemitah year. Pretty much everybody believes that it was a Shemitah year. Now, the way you know it was a Shemitah year on the biblical calendar, okay, we've now entered 5784. So what was this past year? 5783. And what was the year before that? 82. Well, we know 5782 was a Shemitah year, because 5782 is divisible by 7. Christians make it too hard. We also know 5782 was the 49th year of the seven sevens because 5782 is also divisible by 49. So if 5782 is divisible by 49, the following year is a jubilee year, which means we've just left a jubilee year of 5783 and we're now entering 5784. Okay, is everyone following me so far? Kind of, hopefully. Now, there are people, prophetic people in the messianic world who are convinced that 1917 was a jubilee year. 1967 was a jubilee year. Therefore, 2017 has to be a jubilee year. That's nuts. 
just because they're 50 years apart, I mean, if you've been married 50 years, does that mean your first year was a year of Jubilee and your 50th year is a year of Jubilee biblically? No, it just means 50 years have gone by. The reason 2017 can't be a Jubilee year is because it's the second year of a Shemitah cycle. How can, how can a Jubilee year be in the middle of a Shemitah cycle? It has to be at the end of a Shemitah cycle the following year. You follow, is everyone following me? Okay, who's not following me? I want to explain it. Okay. This is the first year of a Shemitah cycle. The second, the third, the fourth, the sixth, the seventh. What is seven times seven? Which means that next year is a Jubilee year. So therefore, none of the Shemitah years can be a Jubilee year. Are you following me? Because it's the seventh year. It's supposed to be following a Shemitah cycle. It's the 50th year. 50, 50 is not a multiple of seven. Okay, so you have seven and another seven, another seven, another, and you do seven sevens, and then the next year is the Jubilee year. That next year is the first year of a new cycle. Okay, and so 2023, what we just left was the 50th year after you do the seven times seven. The 50th year is also the first year of the next cycle. It's not a separate year. Just like Sunday is the first day of the week, it's also the eighth day of the week. You follow me? So the Jubilee year was never a separate year. It was always the first year uh, after the seven sevens. So last year was a Jubilee year because the Jubilee years have to be in the first year of a Shemitah cycle. They can't be in the seventh year. So anyway, I just wanted to put this chart so you could see why the year of Jubilee could never be 1917, could never be 2017. It's all about the math. Okay, how in the world could a Jubilee ever be the second year of a Shemitah cycle? It can't. So 2017, 1967, 1917 could never be biblical Jubilees. Jubilees are not based on a January to January calendar, as I just said. How in the world could a Shemitah year also be a year of Jubilee? So do you see how dumb it is if you're not following the math? Now let me show you one more thing about people who believe he was born at Passover instead of Sukkot. I have so many biblical reasons, but I'm going to give you one of the smartest reasons that prove how dumb it is to think he was born at Passover. How many years did he minister? Three and a half, right? Well, get a load of this. He was three and a half years that he ministered. And it says, and Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. If he ministered three and a half years, and he was about 30 years old, it says he began his ministry right at his birthday. That's what it says. And we know he began on the first of a lull. For 40 days, he was in the wilderness, comes out on Yom Kippur. Okay, and what do we see? If he was actually born at Passover, his ministry would have started at Passover. So he has one Passover, two Passover, three Passovers, and the half a year says he dies on Sukkot then. That doesn't work. But if he was born on Sukkot and started his ministry on Sukkot, and he ministers three and a half years, he now dies on Passover. Does that make sense? That's what I'm saying. It's so much common sense as to why he wasn't born on Passover, as some famous people say. He was born on Sukkot. Okay, with that said, let's stand.